Hello, ciao, Niki Sak, Natasuis Leo, Wanani Nahanagansik, Nutomas Akudneset. Hello, everyone. My name is Leah. I'm a, I'm a citizen of the Narragansett Indian tribe of Rhode Island. Um, I am from the area of Akudneset, which is now North Kingstown today. Uh, I live in North Providence today with my family, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to be closing out this program, uh, the series of Women Do Archaeology. Um, I will come forward and say I am not an archaeologist. I'm not trained in archaeology, um, but I am an Indigenous person with firsthand experience in a lot of what is studied by archaeologists, and so Today, I'm using the opportunity to talk about cooking in clay vessels. Um, I would love it if you could bear with me because it's raining, it's pouring at my house. And this was supposed to be an outdoor program where I was going to be cooking in clay vessels. Um, but with the weather and technical issues, we don't want um, anything to, to kind of happen and we don't want the, the laptop to short circuit or anything like that. So we, we really um, decided that we were going to transition this into a program where I can actively talk about um, pottery and pottery making in native communities and also how we use these clay vessels today. Um, cooking in clay vessels is something that I've been doing for at least 10 years. Um, I do it for demonstrations, I've done it for um, institutions. I've done it when I've worked for tribes and I also do it at home. It's, it's fun. It's tasty. Um, I come from two parents who are very, very good cooks. Um, and they raised me to love good food and to cook traditional food as well. Um, a lot of our ancient foods, our corn and wild rice, our, our game meats and fish. And a lot of what I do in terms of cooking in clay vessels is also stuff that can be cooked right over your open stove or in your oven as well. Um, really, it's the same thing. It's just a little matter of switching the technique over and the technology. And that's how humans have, have lived for thousands of years. You kind of go with what's easiest, but we've also maintained these traditions. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go through a very short presentation um, and showing kind of the different styles of pottery um, that we have. So clay vessels um, kind of show up in the archeological record somewhere around 3000 years ago here in Southern New England. Um, a lot of the work and interpretation I do is Rhode Island and Massachusetts, Southeastern Massachusetts based. Um, I'm part of a blended Narragansett and Wampanoag family. And so uh, both traditions are represented in my household. And so um, those are both recipes, but also looking at um, traditional technologies as well. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the archeology span here in the Northeast, um, these span the, the three periods of the early middle and late woodland periods. Um, prior to this, people were mainly cooking in stone vessels. Um, beautiful soapstone vessels show up in all kinds of um, records as well as in museum collections. Every image that you'll be seeing today, um, and this was an intentional choice that I that I did that I made, was the the pots that you'll be seeing are not from the archaeological record. They are all made by contemporary people. They're all made um, most of them, and I am very indebted to Carrie Helm, um, a Mashpee Wampanoag pot, potter and traditional artisan, and uh, the majority of pots that you'll be seeing in the slideshow are Carrie's pots. Um, she has been practicing this for many, many years. And um, Carrie's pots are both beautiful and functional. Um, so I've cooked in Carrie's clay pots um, many times. And some of the pots that I have um, are made by other members of uh, the native community here. But I really wanted to use contemporary 
images and contemporary pieces because we are still carrying on these traditions. We are still, we are contemporary people carrying on these ancient traditions um, and the design work that's reflected reflects not just the design work that you can see in the archeological record um, that our ancestors made, but also it reflects us too in our symbology. Um, and so we can go through the slideshow a little bit and see the different uh, designs in the pottery. So this is a pretty classic image. Um, I have seen this a lot over my years, um, but this show, this is a um, great illustration of the different types of pottery that are kind of classified here in Southern New England. Um, you'll notice that it really spans uh, all these, all these periods of um, the early wood, the early woodland, middle woodland, and late woodland period. And you'll see that there's differences in shape, there's differences in style. Um, and from a perspective where you're actually going and using these pots um, and the different shapes and styles, there's advantages to the the cone-shaped bottom, and there's different advantages to the rounded bottom as well, as well as some disadvantages. So prior to clay vessels being made, people, like I said before, were using stone vessels, um, which are just massive. They're so beautiful when you're able to see, when you're able to see them. I have not cooked with a stone vessel. Um, it's on my list of things to do in, uh, in the future. Um, and First, I would have to find someone to make me one. Luckily, I know someone. I know a guy. Um, but uh, these, these stone vessels, um, they're quite heavy uh, when compared to a, a smaller, um, I have one here and I'll get into more detail, smaller clay vessel. Um, what's nice about clay, and I've worked with clay, I've made these vessels as well, um, is when you carve things into stone, it's kind of final, right? You chip off too much and that's it. Um, whereas with clay vessels, you mold them, you sculpt them, you make a mistake, that's okay. You can build back upon it. Or if um, when, your, when your pot is drying out before it can be fired, um, maybe, it, maybe it cracks, maybe something happens. Well, you can then take that greenware and you can break it back down and mix it in with clay once again. Um, if you've ever taken a ceramics class, a lot of clay is recycled and you can do that with natural clay. Clay is typically found um, in the areas where the water, both either fresh or salt water um, meets the land. And culturally, these are areas, these are sacred areas of transition. Um, and so, when you have land and sea meeting, you are looking at the meeting of two different realms of the beings that walk upon the earth and the beings that live below the surface of the water. And so there are sacred and ancient beings that are part of both of these worlds. And so when they come together, these are particularly sacred spaces. This is why an area such as a beach is a sacred space. And um, sometimes these areas where you can find clay, um, <clears throat> depending on where they are, sometimes were held in common by different people as well. And so when we have the clay that is forming in these areas, people are harvesting it and taking the clay and harvesting, that process of harvesting is sacred in and of itself. And so just like with hunting or just like with fishing or the taking of plants, um, you, are, you are taking from that, that sacred area and you need to give back. So we have offerings and ceremonies when we gather clay. It's not just, oh, look at this great clay. Let me throw it in my bag and go home unceremoniously. It's, 
it's significant. And also it's significant because you're going to take this raw material, you're going to temper it in some way, whether it's with shell or cattail fluff or sand, and you are going to, or crushed stone, and you're going to mold it and form it into something entirely new and entirely different with your own creative process. And then you are going to cook with it. You are going to make tea with it. You are going to make soup with it. You are going to provide sustenance for your family, for your elders, for your community. And the process of cooking and the process of consuming is inherently sacred. So this whole process from beginning to end of harvesting the clay to the meal that gets put on your table, you're acting and you're, you're participating in the ceremony. So these clay vessels, they have their own life. And um, some of, de depending on the, the dialect that you're um, working with, clay and the term for pot or the term for bowl are animate terms or animate words, um, meaning that they participate in ceremony and therefore they are inherently spiritual as opposed to inanimate. So I owe lots of thanks to Carrie Helm who sent me these images. Um, her pots are absolutely beautiful. They're stunning. They reflect the traditional styles that show up in the archeological record. However, um, they're not carbon copies. They're not total repros. Um, they have things changed because she's an original artist. Um, and any good artist is not just going to do a carbon copy of something else. Um, and so you can see some of these pots have what are called castellations on them. Um, and so the way it was taught to me is that these castellations, they represent the four directions, they represent the, the four seasons, the four cycles or four stages of life. Um, four is a very significant concept in many native societies, especially here in Southern New England. And so um, when you're making pottery, you're putting part of yourself into it. I know that pieces that I have made um, they're, they're not just plain pieces. It's not just like a plain white bowl or a plain, um, a plain red bowl. It has meaning in, in it, inscribed in it. It has significance. And so you're going to do line work and there are many different types of tools that you can use. Um, wooden tools are some of my favorite that I work with. And when I made my first traditional pot, I think I was like 11 or 12. And it actually was not an Narragansett style pot. Um, it was a Cherokee style pot. Um, I was with my mom visiting some family in Cherokee, North Carolina. And I had the opportunity to sit down with um, the, the Cherokee family, the Big Meats, um, that's their surname, and learn the styles of pottery. And um, you know, when you're young, they, they start you out with pinch pots. Um, but, and that's always a lot of fun. Um, and it's kind of a simple where you just start with a ball of clay and you work it around. You may have done it um, in an art class when you were younger, or you may have um, done it with your kids with Play-Doh. Um, I know I spend a lot of time with my four-year-old making pinch pots out of Play-Doh um, at home. But you just work it around till you get a nice, um, even consistency all the way around. That is also how you start the bases of many traditional pots. Um, and so you make the small bowl shape or uh, even a, a pointed cone shape and you work um, coils around it. So you make coils and in that um, I was told that um, the act of making coils and kind of, and, and coiling that pattern around, you're adding and you're building onto it. And um, the symbology of snakes plays a part. And so you coil this around and you, you hand build your pot all the way up um, to the brim where you're going to start either widening it out or coming back in. And 
paddles were typically used by native people throughout Eastern North, North America, usually cordage wrap, wrapped wooden paddles. And this is a great technique for evening out, flattening out your coils. Um, and some people such as in North Carolina, they have these beautifully carved paddles that create a stamping pattern all the way around. So you have your paddles that will create the shape um, and those would be kind of your cordage wrapped or your flat paddles, but then you have the beautifully carved and intricate paddles and that will be your finishing, those will be your finishing paddles. Um, here in the Northeast, we see more of um, a nice smooth edge and then when your pot is um, heading towards the greenware or the finishing aspect that's when you're going to add your decorations in um, your symbology and it's a little bit easier to carve into a drier clay than it is into wetter clay. Um, and so many of the northeastern native pots um, both archaeologically and contemporarily have different um, facial effigies on them. This is shared not only by people of southern New England, um, but further west of us, um, Haudenosaunee people, you can see this show up in their pottery as well. Um, I do not have pictures here, but a wonderful, just incredible potter um, comes from the Haudenosaunee community, Natasha Smoke Santiago. And um, I have some of her pots, um, her smaller decorative pots. I have this teeny little one with beans impressed onto it. And it's just beautiful. And so these traditions of putting um, design work really span throughout many different tribal communities. And so um, a lot of it is also similar um, when it comes to styles of effigies, or uh, if you take a look at the pot on the right, um, this design, uh, I've been told that this is a water style design. I'm not sure if that's um, what Carrie was putting into it, but I know when I've made similar designs with the opposing triangles, those um, oftentimes represent water. And this is natural because you are taking this clay out of an area where you're going to find that water. Um, without, without the water, you cannot mold the clay, you cannot soften it. Um, if you've ever been in an area where a, a clay bed has dried out, it is very hard. Um, and so it's that water that's going to help bring that molding and shaping into it. So pots traditionally um, were not only made for food. Obviously, that is the number one thing that people think of when they think of um, when they think of cooking vessels, right? Is cooking soups, stews, um, things like that. But pots are also good for tea. But even smaller bowls um, are used for for different things. I know in my home we keep medicines. Um, in these smaller clay vessels. It's good to keep things in natural, it's good to keep medicines in natural materials. And so pots ranged in size um, from these small pots that you can hold in the palm of your hand to much larger feast pots, which many people can, um, you can have many servings out of a, a larger style feast pot. Um, there is a great, um, engraving that's done um, and also watercolor by um, John White and then Debray. And these, these images are from um, Virginia. And so these are people, there, there's this image of two people and I should have included it in PowerPoint and I apologize for not, but um, cooking over this huge feast pot um, and you can just imagine just how many people are going to, going to eat a meal out of this massive pot. I mean, it must have been this big. Uh, and there are also historical accounts here in New England 
of pots being so large that children would be found playing hide and seek in them, which I just think is the sweetest little thing. Um, because I imagine my four year olds climbing in a pot. I also imagine myself as a parent saying, no, don't climb in that pot because it will tip over and break. <laughs> but um, for, for there to be accounts of children climbing into pots, you can just imagine how sturdy they have to be. Um, so they really, really are versatile. Um, they, once, once pots are fired um, and firing, Today, many artists use a kiln to fire, but uh, some artists choose to fire in the traditional way or do a blended um, a, a blended method of kiln firing and then finishing in a traditional fire. And what you're going to get when you kiln fire is you're usually you're going to get a nice white, clean looking pot um, and you're going to, uh, have consistency and coloration all the way around or a red pot, depending on the type of clay you're using. When you're doing a traditional fire, you're going to have um, different colorations. And so here I have a traditionally fired pot. And so we have different colorations depending on where in the, the kiln, um, the earthen kiln, it's going to be placed. And so usually when you have uh, when you when you have a traditional fire, you have many pots going at the same time and you're really being careful and you're really tending to that as opposed to a nice convenient electric kiln where you're going to pop them in, set the the timer and walk away. So um, for from a modern perspective, for the look of an older aesthetic or a used aesthetic, um, many artists like to like to do that traditional firing. So finally, let's get talking about actual cooking. And this is what I was hoping to do outside. I was hoping to make some stew and today is a great day for stew, but it is absolutely pouring rain outside and a little bit chilly. So um, this photograph here, um, also courtesy of Carrie Helm, um, she excuse me, uh, she's worked at Plymouth Plantation for many years. And this is such a great setting for seeing how food is traditionally cooked um, at the time of European arrival. But also, this is the same method that people have been using for thousands of years. And so we have um, in these two images, she has a berry nasamp, which is the lower one, the, the purple that you see. Uh, those are typically those are typical porridges um, made out of corn, water, or broth, and people add different berries depending on the time of the year. Uh, whereas the top photograph is a green corn stew or green corn soup. And that's made by taking broth, boiling it down, adding the sweet green corn that you would harvest in uh, around the time of late August, early September. And you're going to add different types of ingredients. Um, a common misconception that is that native food is quite bland um, and it definitely is not. Uh, we had many different types of seasonings. We had many different types of um, ingredients that we could add both fresh and dried and drying was one of the the main ways of preserving food and drying and smoking and so when you make a soup, just like you make a soup at home, you don't just take meat, you don't just take fish and throw it in water and walk away. That would be absolutely terrible. Um, you're going to season it. You can use um, sumac, which would be, which would make a great uh, lemon flavor. It has a nice citrusy flavor, staghorn or smooth sumac I've used. And they also use that in other parts of the world as well. Sassafras makes a great seasoning. Spice bush makes a great seasoning. Um, people would harvest sea salt as well. Um, one of my favorite seasonings is smoke. Just the essence of cooking over an open fire is going to add smoke to it. Uh, you even get a little teeny bit of saltiness from the ash that just kind of naturally occurs when you're cooking in, over an open flame. 
Um, and another great ingredient to add to a lot of your meats um, and also to many of your, your berry dishes, your corn dishes, or your dishes with nuts. Because again, you're eating with the seasons, right? So you're not eating fresh strawberries in January like we do today when we can pick them up from the grocery store. You're eating your strawberries um, around the time of the strawberry moon, which is in June. And once those strawberries are gone, they're gone. But you have enough foresight and enough knowledge to harvest those strawberries and dry them. So you can have strawberries in the winter time. They would just be dehydrated, like we can get dehydrated strawberries or dried blueberries or dried craisins today. Um, nuts are something that has that have a longer shelf life. So once you start harvesting nuts in late September, early October, and I have a bag of black walnuts curing right now, um, right next to my stove. My family, my dad used to put them next to the wood stove. But um, uh, today I keep them next to, next to my Samsung stove because it's always warm over there. But you, you harvest your black walnuts and um, you, you take the outer hulls off of them, you clean them and, and wash them just in a tub or in a pot of water and then you set them to dry. Um, a lot of people set them to dry in the sun and this is a great method until all the squirrels come and take them. And I've learned that the hard way. So today we use a dehydrator for that, um, where you just want to remove the moisture. And then we just pl place them in a cloth bag and you keep them in a warm area next to your stove or your wood stove, or in this case, you'd probably hang them up inside your house, not too far from the fire. And they're going to cure for about six to eight weeks. And then they will, they can be used into the future. I've harvested nuts and I've used this, I've used them five years later with no problem. And so you're going to take your nuts or, or your dried berries or whatever it is, you're going to crack them and then add them into your, into your meat, um, your, your meat broth in order to make meat gravy, um, a nut meat gravy, which is delicious. And uh, berries are also going to be used to flavor and sweeten your food as well. Um, in the spring and summertime, you can get fresh greens, such as ramps, you can get fiddleheads. But once these seasons pass, you either need to use the dried version or you're going to um, kind of be hungry for greens once you get to December and you can't find any. Um, and so, Probably I would say when people are living in the seasonal rounds, when people are living um, by the seasons, which we try to do in our household, and I would have to say this year um, with it being 2020, it's been um, easier than many years for, for my family to do this because we have the opportunity to go outside and take a little bit of time and harvest nuts or harvest maple sap and dry some meat and um, dry some fish and doing it kind of from the comfort of our own home when we're not hustling and bustling around everywhere. It definitely has given me um, an idea of the fact that I can produce food for my family, but it also, it, it also is very, very time consuming. And if you don't do it quickly enough, you're going to lose out on your fresh squashes from your garden and they could get moldy if you don't put them away, um, you know? And so these are all considerations that our ancestors had to make because they weren't living with refrigerators and freezers and easy dehydrators um, to put things up. So a lot of work goes, goes into it and a lot of infrastructure such as building smokehouses and having the right equipment. Um, because once you get to late February, early March, right before the sap starts running, um, you're eating a lot of your dried stored food. Um, and you're eating what can be maybe ice fished, but if the ice is breaking up too early, it's not safe. You can maybe hunt, but a lot of those animals, if it's a hard winter, they may be struggling as well and they may be scarce too. So 
traditionally we would welcome the time when the sap runs through the trees. And this is very, um, this is very unique to Eastern North America. Um, the, the population of Acer sacrum, which is red me um, sugar maple, um, also red maple, silver maple, black maple. These are trees that can all be tapped and um, their distribution here in Eastern North America um, from uh, pretty much Pennsylvania, uh, north into Quebec and west over to about Minnesota. Um, these are the areas where you'll find these trees and you will also get a very interesting thing that happens to allow for the sap to run through the tree and subsequently be harvest, where harvested where you have days above freezing and nights below freezing. And when you have this consistently in um, a few days in a row, the sap is, is going to run and our ancestors would harvest that sap out of the tree. Um, one of the things that I encounter a lot kind of in this mythos of, um, of native practice is that native people solely use the process of stone boiling when it came to making maple syrup and maple sugar. And I find this incredibly frustrating. Um, I do not doubt that people did stone boiling. It's known um, you can do it. But when you are rendering gallons and gallons of maple sap, um, considerations have to be made for using clay vessels to make maple syrup. Um, unfortunately, one thing that gets really repeated um, is that Native people solely used um, the stone boiling method of taking hot, if you're not familiar, taking hot rocks right out of the ash, like these um, these fire pits that you see here, and you can see they're covered with ash, and taking hot rocks out of them and putting them into trenches of uh, wooden trenches filled with sap. Um, yes, you're going to get a hard boil, but you're also going to get this awful, terrible, toxic sludge of uh, wood ash, of lye um, in your maple syrup that you're not going to be able to eat and you're not really going to, to be able to render it um, down into sugar. And so one, one concern that I really have is that many um, smaller institutions around the, the general Northeast region, such as nature centers, um, repeat this information without really thinking about the practicality of it. Um, thinking about the practicality of taking hot rocks covered with ash um, and then eating or consuming a product that has a high content of lye in it. Um, this would be very problematic. And I don't think many native people would survive if people were consistently doing this, um, even for just one season. And so it's important to, to understand that even though it wasn't necessarily recorded or there was one or two recordings of sap boiling um, with stone, that's not the end all and be all. And when we look at the historical record, it's important to note that Europeans were mentioning a lot of the things that they found that were out of the ordinary. They were not looking at the day-to-day -day, um, kind of monotonous tasks um, one of the things that was brought up in a, in a couple of the other lectures as part of the series is that um, both modern archaeologists but also and, and ethnographers, but also um, people making those initial recordings, they were not necessarily paying attention to the day-to-day tasks that women were participating in and such as getting into the details and the nitty-gritty of cooking you know they they would say oh um this man's wife no name of course um made the soup and it was delicious but that was it 
and he goes on and he talks about the business that he engages with with the native man but um when it comes to the recipes nobody's talking about them when it comes to paying attention to what kind of seasonings they're putting in the pot nobody's talking about it when it comes to um talking about boiling sap when it comes out of the tree is clear and it looks just like water is someone really going to take the effort to write down their boiling water if they don't understand fully what it is. And so these are the things that we really need to read in between the lines and be careful about when it comes to interpretation and public interpretation as, um, as either a museum or a cultural center or an individual um, portraying um, or, or discussing uh, different methods of say sap boiling um, at more local festivals. Um, because when we decide to say native people are only using this method, this very problematic method of rendering sap into syrup and then syrup into sugar, we are giving into the concept of primitivism. And this is something that we cannot allow to happen um, because obviously native people were very good at what they did a whole economy was was built in the the early 17 to mid 1700s on native sugar production in new england and in quebec um, native people i love some of the the original um some of the the original recordings of Native people interacting with both the English and the French. And there's one in particular where the English are complaining that the Native people were selling, and this is in Quebec, that the Native people were selling um, fine maple sugar to the French, but to the English, they, they sold them a more expensive version that was cut with cornmeal. And this all is during the, the French and Indian War. And I think that I, I just love the passive aggressive um, nature of that particular interaction. But, um, but when sugar production um, in areas where um, people were not necessarily um, had access to sugar production that was coming out of the slave trade, people were supplementing with native made maple sugar. Um, and it became so part of the, the local area um, cuisine, non-native people were producing it. And the majority of maple producers today are non-native people. And the, there are many different reasons for that, but, but one really big, issue is lack of access, lack of access to those maple groves that were once native maple groves um, are now out of the hands of native families. So when buying maple syrup um, and maple products um, in, in our home, if, I'm, if we are not producing it and we don't produce it every year, it depends on how busy we are. If we are not producing it for ourselves, we make an effort to always go and find the native produced maple syrup, such as Passamaquoddy maple syrup or um, Mashantucket Pequot maple syrup. Um, and they're delicious and they support the local native economies. I just have this quick video. Um, this is a, a video that was produced some years ago, so the video quality is not great. Um, but you can see one of the the arguments that was brought up is that native pottery could not withstand um, harsh boiling, um, which I think is kind of silly, but um, because I've boiled many things in, in clay vessels. Here we go. And you can see that it does stand up um, when you boil off that, that water. It's the ratio when you're boiling maple sap is 40 gallons of maple sap to one gallon of maple syrup. And then um, it's usually one to one with syrup to sugar. And so um, a lot of boiling has to go on um, prior to 
the final rendering of it. So you're just doing gallons and gallons and gallons at a time just to get a small mason jar. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just have a couple of quick acknowledgements. Um, and I want to do a little bit of um, just close looking at objects that I have um, that in my home that we use actively um, for uh, our family, but also for um, demonstrations that we do. Um, but before I get into that um, and stop sharing the screen, um, I just want to have a couple acknowledgments. I definitely want to acknowledge Carrie Helm for the use of all of her photos in showing con contemporary traditions of Native pottery. I also want to thank Elizabeth James Perry, whose pots I will be showing um, in a moment. And I also want to thank Jonathan James Perry, my partner, if you don't know me. <laughs> um, I, I want to thank him because he actually made um, a, another piece I'll be showing, um, a paddle. And um, I also want to thank Dan Shears, who's on this call, and I'm so excited, who, um, and he's probably thinking why, because I'm also going to show the great maple cones that he makes me every year for maple sugaring. Um, so this is just my contact information. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, um, but feel free if you have any questions, always uh, feel free to email me. So I have a few different pieces. This particular one um, is made by Elizabeth James Perry. Um, and you can see smaller pot. I typically use this for my teas. Um, so it has its original um, firing marks on it, but you can see the use, uh, maybe getting a little bit too, too close to the fire. So when I cook in, in these small vessels with the pointed bottom, the pointed bottom is really great for, um, nestling right directly into the coals. You can see here, there's a little bit of tea residue. Um, it's 2020, so I haven't really gone out and, and done, um, many demonstrations this year. So it might be a little bit dusty from sitting on my shelf. Um, I always like to keep my traditional cooking implements in the kitchen of my home because it, it really is a way for me to, when I'm cooking, look at those objects and remember and to, to connect to those traditions. And also to, to bring things to the forefront of, I'm making, this delicious food here in my kitchen. How would I make this over an open fire? What are things that I would like to do? Because um, I like to share a lot of recipes, especially when I do these, uh, when I do cooking demonstrations, um, I like to share recipes, but I also like to think of how practical um, it would be for people. So this is um, a great pot for nestling right into the coals, but you'll notice that it will not really stand up very well so we use these cedar rings um, to, to store the pots. Um, it's just a little nicer than storing them upside down someplace. Um, but these are also adorned with design work. And then this is what in my home we call the torpedo. <laughs> it's a, oh, it's a very large pot. I guess we can't see it too well on here. Lift this up a little bit. Here we go. All right. And so this is what we call the torpedo in my house. It does, it definitely has a torpedo look. Um, you can see it has a little bit of wear right over here. Um, when you, you cook in pots over and over and over again, um, sometimes you get a bit of wear. Sometimes um, a piece might break off, especially if it's been cooked um, or if it's been um placed right up against those rocks. So again, this has a, the cone-shaped bottom to nestle it right into, um, right into the hearth, right into the ash. Uh, you can kind of still see some of the oils on it here. And when I clean my pots, I use, um, I use hot water. I use um, usually a horsetail brush, which has silica in it. Um, we're gonna just take a look at the, the castellations here. And it's a little bit dark, it's a little harder to see. So um, the larger castellations um, and, and just the, the general larger shape, I've used this pot to boil um, maple sap in and it's come out fine. I've never had a problem. Um, this particular boo-boo though <laughs> had nothing to do with boiling maple sap. Um, I just kind of tipped it into a rock. 
And so when you work with these, um, when you work with these pots, because they have the, the pointed bottom, you really want something that's going to kind of scrape that bottom. You're not using just a flat uh, wooden cooking spoon. So I have a nice paddle here. This was the paddle that was made by my partner um, with traditional notch design. This is a tiger, this is tiger maple. And so um, using it, it fits both in both pots. Um, and I've used it to kind of just scrape up the bottom, especially when you make things like uh, nasamp and, and cornmeal or cornmeal porridge, um, it's kind of sticky. So this is a great tool. Uh, for getting right into all the nooks and crannies. I also have Dan's birch bark cones here. And I want to say katapatash to Dan. I have not used these ones yet because um, I did not maple this year. I did not go maple sugaring this year. Um, but usually what we'll do is when we make maple sugar, and I have some maple sugar stored here in a jar that we made this year, um, the, the maple sugar will be stored in these birch bark cones, but before it gets to this pine fat, um, this finer powder, um, it can go through a period of where it hardens. And traditionally, this is how people would store maple sugar. Um, not so much in the fine granulation, but in the harder granulation where you'd have to scrape it off. Uh, think about what happens if you leave a bag of brown sugar open for too long, right? It gets, um, it gets hard and you have to usually scrape it up. Um, so these are uh, cone, cones made out of winter bark. And I want to say a huge thank you because Dan always supplies me with um, with these birch bark cones every year to um to store my sugar in. It's up at Tonamu everyone. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, you can email me um, at Leah underscore Hopkins at brown.edu.